Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Happy Easter to you all. Happy Easter. I have just a couple of announcements this morning. Um, in your bulletins, there is a flyer for the One Great Hour of Sharing offering, which the Presbyterian Church participates in every year. There is an envelope inside if you wish to donate to the One Great Hour of Sharing. Just uh, put your offering in there and just put it in the offering plate uh, when you come to church on Sunday morning. Um, your gifts will be appreciated. Uh, the money is used to help projects all over the world, uh, not just for Presbyterians. So it's a very worthy cause, and it's one of the few offerings that the entire denomination uh, participates in. Uh, the other announcement is that our annual congregational meeting will be held on Sunday, April 18th at 3 p.m. here in the church sanctuary. And you are all invited to attend to hear the reports of the organizations, the work that they've done in the past year. Even though we were closed down for a good part of the year, the work of the church still went on. Uh, the deacons and the elders and um, members were still working for the Lord during that time. So hear their reports. Um, you can hear the budget. And uh, if you have any questions on the budget, uh, I'm sure our treasurer will be happy to answer them. And uh, then we will also have nominations for elders and deacons. So it's an important meeting uh, for the members of the church. And But anyone is invited to attend. Uh, you can comment on anything that's going on. You just can't vote. But it's open. Uh, as are, I want to say this too, session meetings are also open to anyone who wants to attend them. Um, just for information, uh, if you want to get an inside look as to what the church is doing, the work of the church on a, on a regular basis, uh, our, our session meetings are announced on two or three Sundays before their meeting. So you are welcome to attend, and uh, if you've got something to suggest or something to complain about, um, that's the place to do it. Don't do it among yourselves and then nothing happens. Uh, come to the session meeting and say, you know, I don't like what's going on, or why don't we do this, or whatever is on your mind. The only way the elders are going to know uh, what you are thinking, what you're feeling, is if you come and let them know. So uh, I've been meaning to say that. I am not a member of, the, of this church, uh, but I am invited to the session meeting. I can't vote. But um, my opinion is asked sometimes, and I get it, and I voice my opinion at times too. So please, um, I'm not sure that that's been generally known among the congregation, the members at large. And so keep that in mind uh, at the next session meeting, and uh, we're more than happy to see you. And now, let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship Lord, the Lord. Mm.
morning we're asking that you remain seated during the worship service today. Thank you. And now let us join together in our call to worship. Early in the morning light, the women went to the tomb. The tomb was empty, the stone rolled away. For God, God loves us stronger than death itself. Let us join our voices with Mary Magdalene. We are the Lord. Easter people, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And let us pray together. Glory to you, O God. On this day you won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ. For us and for our salvation, you overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into truth. Glory to you, O blessed Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Our hymn is Jesus Christ is Risen Today. Forgive us when we cannot carry it. 
You cast a vision for peace and justice. Forgive us when we cannot imagine it. Forgive us when we stand in its way. For you are the God of the empty tomb, the one who makes all things new. And let us confess our own personal silent confession. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. And you may turn and greet each other with a wave. We haven't seen each other in a long time. A different way of passing peace. responsive reading this morning is taken from Psalm 18. Let us listen for the word of God to us this morning as we read responsibly. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks to you for your thanks. For you answer me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we ask that you will open our hearts and our ears to hear your word this morning. Our gospel reading for the day comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in, and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must be raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A worldwide celebration. Eureka Springs, Arkansas is the home of the great passion play in the Ozarks. And there is a somewhat humorous story going around about the actor who at one time played the part of Christ in the passion play. As the actor arrived um, carrying the cross up the hill of Golgotha, a tourist began heckling him, making fun of him, and he was shouting insults at him. 
Well, finally the actor had had enough. He couldn't take any more. So he threw down the cross, walked over to the heckler, and punched him out. <laughs> well, after the play was over, the director came to him and he said, um, I know that guy was a pest, but, but I can't condone what you did. You're playing the part of Jesus. And Jesus never, ever retaliated. So don't ever do anything like that again. Well, the actor promised he wouldn't. The next day, the heckler was back, worse than the day before. Finally, the actor exploded and did the same thing, punched him out a second time. And the director said, that's it. I, I, I have to fire you, I'm sorry. We just can't have you behaving that way, playing the part of Jesus. And the actor said, please, please give me one more chance. I need the job. I really need this job and I can promise I can handle it if it happens again. Well, the director decided to give him one more chance. The next day, he was climbing the cross up the street. Sure enough, the heckler was there again. And you could tell by looking at the actor carrying the cross that he was biting his tongue, he was gritting his hands, he was grinding his teeth. And finally, finally, just as it was about to get the best of him, he went over to the heckler and he said, I'll meet you after the resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you won't find that story anywhere in the New Testament. It's certainly not part of the Passion narrative. And it certainly does not accurately portray or reflect Christ's character. Thank goodness for that, right? If Christ came back from the grave seeking revenge on all those who had persecuted him or let him down, or denied him, think about it. Who among us would be on this list, perhaps? We call ourselves Christ followers, but we're also those who from time to time have disappointed our master in a very real way. I'm glad the real story ends just the way it does. Each of the eyewitnesses in the New Testament gives differing accounts of Christ's resurrection. And here is the Apostle John's account. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from its entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and another disciple, who seems to be the Apostle John, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and John started for the tomb, and they were both running, but John outran Peter and got to the tomb first. When he got there, he saw the stone had been rolled away, and he looked in. He did not go in, but he looked in, and he could see the um, cloths lying there. And of course, along came Peter, always the impulsive one, and he ran right past John and went into the tomb, and also saw the cloths lying there but there was no body. The body was gone, and the tomb was empty. Finally, John also went inside, and the Gospel writer says, he saw and believed. But he also adds, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. That's interesting, don't you think? The disciples didn't have a clue what Jesus' missing body meant. You and I are here in this sacred place on this Easter Sunday morning, assured, assured that Christ has conquered death. But the early disciples didn't have such assurance. That first Easter Sunday morning was instead a time for grief and reflection. They had found a man named Jesus, they come to know him as someone special, someone unique. They believed, they did really believe that he was the Messiah, the one who had come to save Israel. But they were unsure as to what that really meant. There was certainly nothing militaristic about Jesus. It would really be strange to hear someone who's getting ready to lead a revolt against the Roman Empire 
to say something like, love your enemies. No one recorded him as saying to any adversary anything like that. I'll take care of you after the resurrection. No, he would never say anything like that. So what kind of Messiah was he? Well, he know he wasn't a wimp, was he? No wimp could have driven the tax collectors out of the temple. No wimp in the middle of the terrible suffering could have forgiven those who had put him on the cross. He was a strong man, but a man not given to vengeance and certainly not given to violence. More than anything, he was a man of peace. He even spoke peace to the waves of the sea and they calmed right down. He was a man of healing, a man of acceptance, a man of love. Now, he was gone, crucified, dead, buried. That's the reality. That's the reality that confronted the disciples and the other followers on that first Easter Sunday morning. And then, as if to make the story even more cruel, his body had gone missing. Think what that meant. All of the world's people weep, weep for the fallen, fallen leaders, don't they? They come and visit their graves, they leave mementos there and pictures and poems and, and other remembrances of their affection for their leaders. But Jesus' followers would never have that opportunity. They would never be able to memorialize it because he was gone and he had no idea where he was. The women had gone to the tomb and found the stone rolled away. His body was gone. They're confused. They're afraid. What's going on? Is someone playing a cruel trick on the disciples and his followers? Well, then the stories start coming in. Mary has a conversation with a man whom she thinks is the gardener, and it turns out to be the risen Lord. Later on the same day, two men are on a trip to Emmaus, and they're joined by a stranger who asks them, what's been going on today? All kinds of stuff happening today. And they told him, and they realized later in the day when they sat down to a meal with him, and he broke the bread and gave them the cup that they had been visiting with the risen Lord. And then later in that evening, through the locked doors, Jesus appeared to the disciples and he showed them his hands and his side. And at that point, they are overjoyed to discover finally that their master is alive. It's an amazing, an amazing story. Jesus' followers go from despair to astounding joy, all in the bounds of a single day. And that joy still resounds today, more than 2,000 years later. The proclamation, believe it or not, the proclamation of that joy started early this morning in New Zealand uh, with the pealing of the church bells, and then it was carried by jubilant voices and choirs and millions of believers all over Asia and Africa and through all the cathedrals of, of Europe and finally over here to North and South America where we are gathered along with millions of others today praising God for the fact that Jesus is alive. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. So let's consider briefly what today, what this Easter day really means to our lives. First of all, Christ has conquered death. It's the same message every Easter, but it never ever grows old. And because we, we do this every year, please don't shut your ears off because you know the story. Keep your ears and your minds and your spirits open today. Who knows, some new nugget of wisdom may come through from the Lord to your heart and your spirit today. The truth is, Christ has conquered death. Christ has made the journey from this world to the next, and he has returned. He's come back to tell us that the journey is a safe one. A loving father 
is waiting on the other side with the gift of eternal life for us. Now you can raise many quite reasonable arguments against the idea of resurrection. But one thing cannot be argued, and that is the dramatic change that took place in the life of the disciples after that first Easter. Nearly all of them were eventually martyred. Some of them suffered very grievously, but they simply did not fear death. They knew, they knew, deep within their souls, that death had been conquered. Where, O oh death, is your sting? Where, O oh death, is your victory? Says Paul. Those early disciples knew that death could no longer sting, no longer devour them. Death had been conquered. The knowledge that death had been conquered freed them to live and love, knowing that whatever happened, life goes on. Dr. W.A. Criswell, the former pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas, said on one occasion he found himself on a plane and he was sitting beside a well-known theologian. And the man told Dr. Criswell about how his little boy had recently died. He said that the child had come home from school one day with a fever and the family thought it was just a childhood thing and, and didn't think anything of it, but he got worse. And, they took him to the hospital and they found out he had a very virulent form of meningitis. And the doctor said to this theologian and his uh, devastated wife that the boy was not going to survive. They couldn't save him. And so this seminary professor, loving his son as he did, sat by the child's bedside as his son passed from this world to the next. And it was the middle of the day, he told Dr. Criswell, and the little boy's vision began to fade and, uh, and uh, it got dark and cloudy. And uh, the little boy said, Daddy, uh, it's getting dark, isn't it? And uh, his dad said, yes, son, it's getting dark, very dark. And the dying boy said, Daddy, um, I guess it's time for me to go to sleep, isn't it? And the daddy said, yes, son, it's time for you to go to sleep. Now the little boy had a habit of scrunching his pillow up in a special way and he put his hands down and he put his head on his hands. So the little boy did just that. He put the pillow just so and he put his hands up and he put his head down and uh, he said, uh, just, uh, just as he was getting ready to go to sleep, he said, good night daddy, I'll see you in the morning. And then he closed his eyes in death and stepped over into heaven. At that point, the professor sat and just looked out the airplane window and didn't say anything for a long time. And finally, he turned back and he looked at Dr. Criswell and tears were coming down his face and he said, Dr. Criswell, I can hardly wait for morning. That professor knew that death had been conquered and therefore he could go on with his life knowing that his son was safe and he would see him at some point in the future. Leighton Farrell tells about the mother, one of the members of his church, who was confined to a bed in a nursing home. Uh, she was ill and there were times when she would get out of bed and she would fall, so they had restraints put on her. And there was a sign up over her bed that said, this patient must be restrained at all times. And th the daughter, her daughter would say to her pastor that, Every time she walked into that room and saw that sign, it broke her heart because the mother was so upset at not being able to get out and couldn't move out of the bed. She was confined 24-7 to that bed. And, uh, and she asked her daughter every day, please get me out of this bed. Well, finally, the good woman died. And her daughter said the first thing she did when her mother was taken out of the room, you know what it is, she went into that room she took that notice off the wall. She tore it in pieces and threw it in the trash. And she said, thank God she's free at last. And she was free. Just as each of us who truly believe in Christ as our Lord and Savior will be free someday. That is why the church bells peal around the world. Death has been conquered. We are free to live and love with the knowledge that whatever happens 
life and love extend beyond the grave. This is what gives us hope and a sense of peace regardless of the situation. And certainly we have all been in unusual situations this past year and more. But we have hope and we have peace. Life is not easy, and it certainly hasn't been easy for most of us in some way or another. And sometimes, sometimes we falter, sometimes we doubt, sometimes we fail. But Christ's resurrection tells us that life does have meaning and our efforts do have lasting value. Life and love prevail. And that gives us hope for the living of our lives. Easter is important not only as a sign that death has been conquered, but also that life has been conquered. We no longer need to live in slavery to fear. John's Gospel says, because I live, you also will live. And that is the greatest good news to the world. In a sermon entitled Easter as an Earthquake, Bishop William Willman tells about a devastating earthquake that took place in China in the 1950s. And as a result of the quake, a huge boulder uh, was dislodged from a mountain. And the sudden opening in the mountain left a cave that showed a huge treasure trove of wonderful artifacts from a thousand years ago. A new world, says Willman, suddenly became visible. And then Willman adds this thought concerning that very first Easter. When the stone was rolled away and the earth shook, we got our first glimpse of a new world, a world where death doesn't have the last word. Death has been conquered. We are free to live and love with the knowledge that whatever happens, life and love extend beyond the grave. Because he lives, we can live victoriously, freely, without fear. That's why around the world, today above all days, bells are ringing and choirs are singing. He is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. We will now proceed to the reception of new members. On behalf of the session, I present Janice Jackson and Jim Widener, who have been received into membership of this congregation by reaffirmation of faith. Friends, as members of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, you do not come to us as strangers, but as a sister and brother in the Lord. We welcome you to the worship and work of this people of God. There is one one body and one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Please answer the following question. Do you promise to be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way, and so fulfill your calling as a disciple of Jesus Christ the Lord? Answer that to you. I do. And now let each one of us affirm our faith as we say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
unless you shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. O God, our Father, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number this brother, this sister in faith. Together, may we live, live in your spirit and so love one another that we may have the mind of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom we give all honor and glory forever. Welcome to this ministry of Jesus Christ. Welcome, John David. Welcome, Sir Lord. Joys and concerns. Um, do we have any joys today? <clears throat> Walt and I are celebrating our 40th wedding anniversary today. Congratulations. <laughs> Family of Bud Taylor. Family of 
Bud Taylor. George Taylor? Bailon Bud Taylor. I'm sorry. It's the masks. <laughs> Say again, I'll stick it down. Bud, B U D, Bud, Bud Taylor. T A Y L O R? T A Y L O R. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. All right, let us look to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity and privilege of gathering in your house today on this very special occasion when we celebrate uh, your resurrection from the dead and our resurrection into new life as we believe and put our trust and our faith in you. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity of being back together in worship again after such a long time being apart. Father, we have joys and, uh, to celebrate today. We Thank you for the birthday of Wilson and the anniversary of Dawes and Walter. Lord, bless them in their, their special day today and uh, give them joy in celebrating. And Father, we pray for our long list of friends who are usually listed in the bulletin. But Lord, we've been praying for them so long. We, we know their names by heart and we just put them before your throne of grace for your healing and your your care and your comfort. And we pray especially today for Marge Kowalko in the hospital. Lord, give her peace of heart and mind in this strange situation that she finds herself in. And give the doctors and nurses wisdom in treating her infections that she will be um, out soon and, and back worshiping with us. We pray for Betty Franks and George Marson too, Lord, for their needs. You know what they are, Lord, and we pray that you would meet them. And then we put the family of Bud Taylor into your hands for your comfort. Uh, help them to look to you, Lord, for strength in these difficult days. Father, we thank you for the opportunity of just gathering again uh, in your house this morning. And we pray that as the vaccinations go forward at a, a rap more rapid pace, that we will be able to do more things together as a congregation and as families. And we look forward to that time, Father. Lord, we pray again, as always, for our nation, for peace in our land, for the resurgence of faith across our nation. Lord, we seem to be moving further and further away from you instead of closer to you. And we pray that that trend would be more, people would be more aware of your love for them and put their trust in you day by day and live for you day by day. Lord, we have our own personal prayers that we are bringing to you now in these moments of silent prayer. And now let us pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day of our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, and as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the land is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn is Thine is the Glory. <coughs> Thank you.
have given us this past week. We pray that we will be blessed in our giving, and pray that we pray that you would use these gifts to further your mission in this community and elsewhere as you direct us. Again, thank you, Lord, for the generosity you have shown us that we are able to return to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Christ the Lord has risen today. Thank you. 